Actually, I call him David. He is a pastor, but I've known him for 20 years, and the deal is, is that God has done a remarkable uh, revelatory work in David's life, and uh, he shared so much with me over the years and been, you know, so helpful to me. But I think tonight is critical that David brings the teaching of some interesting individuals in the Old Testament that have such uh, flagrant uh, types in the New Testament and in what we're seeing in modern-day Christendom. And I want to read uh, tonight a, an interesting word, and then we're going to go to David, and David will get into uh, Eli or however you want to take it. But listen to this. As I was praying, Doug and everyone, this is what I got, Jeremiah fifty-one twenty-nine through 31. And the land shall tremble in sorrow, for every purpose of the Lord shall be performed against Babylon to make the land of Babylon a desolation without an inhabitant. The mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. In other words, they've given up. They have remained in their holes, hiding away. I'm just answering that. Their might hath failed. They became as women. They have burned her dwelling places. Her bars are broken. One post shall run to meet another, and one messenger to meet another, to show the king of Babylon that his city is taken and at one end. So tonight, in the first hour, Doug, we've kind of got a, a kind of a basic layout, but it's critical that people understand that because of the apostasy and the perversion and twisting of the Word of God, and there's so few people in the uh, pulpits, there are marvelous men in the pulpits, but there are so few when you take them into context of the total number of, quote, houses of worship, that they won't deal with the issues. In other words, they have become women. And the friendship with the world is enmity with God. So I'm asking Pastor Langford to share the things because they're, they're, the fear of the Lord is a beginning of wisdom. And you cannot have the fear of God and love evil. If you love one, you're going to basically love the evil and you're going to forsake the Lord. Tonight we're giving the clarion call for people to come back to Jesus, to come into a new relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why it's time, Doug, and that's what the title of tonight's program is, is for the men of God to man up and stand up for the Lord Jesus Christ. It still is an astonishing thing to me that people act like complete fools at sports games. But when it comes to the most incredibly wonderful uh, uh, being in the entire universe, everybody goes silent. It's kind of like uh, they know nothing well, the point is, is that the mighty men of Babylon have forborne to fight. It is my contention, and you've had John Price on your show, that America is either Babylon, a mystery Babylon, or the daughter of Babylon. I think it's both. I think the bottom line is we are under judgment. And years ago, having been on talk radio for 20 years, people can remember my statement when I said, when I sought God on this, how, Lord, soon will your judgment fall? He said, as to their specific sins, so will their judgments be. In other words, God doesn't have to shotgun the whole earth. He can be very specific and targeted. And David's going to share about Eli, and, and, and the, I'll let David share that, and about uh, and David, wherever you want to go. But it's critical to understand the lives of men that basically stand as representation of where they should be re representing the truth and calling people to repentance and to turn from our wicked ways they basically just put up with the nonsense and turn a blind eye. So with that, I'll turn it over to Pastor David. Okay, Steve, thank you for the introduction, and uh, I concur profusely with everything that you just said there. I want to go to 1 Samuel. I want to read a passage of Scripture. There's about eight or nine verses here, but I think it's imperative that we get an understanding of where we are relative to the sins of leadership, uh, not only in the church, but in our national leadership. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, beginning at verse 12, And there ran a man of Benjamin out of the army, and came to Shiloh the same day, with his clothes rent, and with earth upon his head. And when he came, lo, Eli sat upon a seat by the wayside, watching for his, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. And when the man came into the city, and told it, all the city cried out, and when Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What meaneth the noise of this tumult? And the man came in hastily and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety and eight years old, and his eyes were dim that he could not see. And the man said unto Eli, I am he that came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. And he said, What is there done, my son? And the messenger answered and said, Israel is fled before the Philistines, and there hath been also a great slaughter 
among the people. And thy two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God is taken. And it came to pass, when he made mention of the ark of God, that he fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate, and his neck broke, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy, and he had judged Israel forty years. And his daughter-in-law, Phinehas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. And when she heard the tidings that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and travailed, for her pains came upon her. And about the time of her death, the women that stood by her said unto her, Fear not, for thou hast borne a son. But she answered not, neither did she regard it. And she named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory is departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. And she said, The glory is departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. The reason I wanted to share that with you is because in the previous chapters, we find Hophni and Phinehas both were committing adultery. They were adulterous men. And Steve just alluded to the scripture in James 4, 4, Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now I know most modern day Christians would not look at themselves as an enemy of God. But if you are worldly, and the spirit of worldliness has pervaded and permeate your heart, you may not know it, but you are hostile toward God by your very nature. Eli was the high priest. His name literally means lofty one or high priest. But here's what is so concerning. Phineas, his name means serpent. Hophni's name means pugilist. So we got one that acts cunning and subtle like a serpent, and the other is a boxer. He's a fighter. He opposes God in every sense of the word. But yet Eli, being their dead and judge and high priest of Israel, would not deal with the sin. So this Benjamite, uh, he comes running to bring this terrible, terrible news. And when he comes, uh, Eli is concerned, what? does the noise of the tumult mean? What, what's this commotion? And the Bible said that Eli was 90 and 8 years old, and his eyes were dim. That speaks of the church today. People can't see clearly. Proverbs 29, 18 says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. When people lose their spiritual eyesight, they can't see where we are or where they are. They, they can't behold the darkness. In the book of Revelation, we are admonished to put eye salve on our eyes that we might see our true spiritual condition because the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3 says we're rich, we're increased with goods, and we have need of nothing. But God says, no, you're wretched, you're miserable, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked, and you're destitute. But for whatever reason, well, I know what the reason is, it's sin, for Men can't seem to see the danger that they are in. Eli, because his eyes were dim, he, he couldn't see the danger of what was taking place. And what is concerning, he says to the Benjamite, what is there done? And, and the messenger said, there's been a great slaughter among the people. And people don't realize it. There is about to be great slaughter in this land. Now, I was in prayer this morning. And I felt such a heaviness on my heart. All I did was weep, and I just told the Lord how much I loved him. Because I'm telling you, if you'll fall in love with Jesus again, people always say, where, where can I go to church? Well, where can I find fellowship? The greatest fellowship, people, is in the presence of God. Psalm 16, verse 11, in thy presence is fullness of joy. You don't have to be around a preacher or musicians and singers. Moses was on the backside of the desert, and God appeared in a burning bush, and he told Moses, take off your shoes. You are standing on holy ground. You don't have to be in a particular place for God to manifest his power and his presence. It's not the position or the posture. It's the heart. It's the heart that God looks on. 
And if people would just get sincere with God, it's, it's not the church, it's not the edifice, it's not the building, it's simply getting into his presence. And because there is such a lack of desire of being in the presence of God, there's about to be a, a, a massive slaughter, a great slaughter among the people. And, of course, the messenger said, both your sons, Hophni and Phinehas, both, they're dead. And the ark of God is taken, which symbolized the presence of God. But here's what is stunning. The next verse says, it came to pass when he made mention of the ark of God that he, Eli, fell from off the seat backward by the side of the gate. Now, the seat was very close proximity to the, to the temple of God, the Old Testament tabernacle. That was a seat of judgment. It was a seat of justice because Eli was high priest and judge both. When people would come to him, he was supposed to meet out honest uh, and judicate decisions and, 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 and meet out the right judgment to the people. But here was the problem. Sin was in the camp through his own sons. They were sleeping with the, the temple uh, women that would do the menial task in the temple. They, they would work around there, and they were seducing these women. They were literally committing adultery. And, but he wouldn't deal with their sins. And because he wouldn't deal with sin or be accountable, he fell off that seat of judgment. And what happened? His neck hit the gate, and he broke his neck. Now, 1 Peter 4, 17, 18 says, For the time has come that judgment must first begin at the house of God, and if it first began at us. What shall the end be to them who obey not the gospel? For if the righteous scarcely be saved, where will the sinner and the ungodly appear? Now, he's emphatic. Judgment begins in the house of God. Steve gave a, a, a prophetic word a few weeks ago when Rick Warren's son uh, committed suicide. Uh, these two men that were Eli's sons were killed. As I was in prayer this morning, I have four children, and I can't make them live right, but I can live right because I'm an adult man. I, I, I am mature in the Lord, and I, 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 I pursue God to live right. I don't, I'm not talking about games here. I'm talking about being sincere. When I, when I err, when I sin, the Holy Ghost convicts me and says, you need to get on your knees and get right with God. Romans 2, 4 says, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. God gave his son Jesus to die on a cross. And then he brings the presence of the Holy Spirit to come along and to touch us and to break us and to lead us to repentance. And yet people still don't want to repent. And so because Eli would not judicate correctly, he fell from off the seat, hit the gate, broke his neck. And there's also a prophecy in, in, in the fourth chapter or the third chapter here for Samuel. Because of the sins of, of uh, Hophni and Phinehas and Eli not dealing with it, God cut them off from the priesthood. They would never again have a son that could deal in the, the temple relative as a Levitical priest because of their sins. And so Peter says, where does judgment begin? It first begins at God's house. Why? Because we're to know the truth. We are to be the salt. We are to be the light. And I got a revelation yesterday about that. When the salt has lost its savor, it's good for nothing but to be thrown out in the streets. And what happens? It's trod underfoot of men. We, the church, if we don't keep our saltiness, if we don't keep our light, there's going to be a great slaughter in the church. I'm telling you, it's going to happen because he said it would be cast in the street and be trodden over feet of men. And we're, the, we're, the, we're supposed to be the salt and the light. The next thing that we see here, it says that Eli was an old man. He was heavy. Look at the condition for the most part of our government and our churches. They are obese. They are heavy in, 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 in finances and in debt. Uh, it, it's, uh, everything is overbearing. E everything is just overweight. Everything about our society right now is, and, and, and regretfully, uh, it's, it's happening to the physicality of people. They're literally overweight physically because they're, they're not taking care of their bodies. But we're, we're in this declension. And, and I believe Phineas' wife, we don't, we, we don't even know what her name is, speaks of the church, and we're about to go into a travail. We're about to go into labor called great tribulation. 
and and she bowed herself, and she had this child, Ichabod, and that simply means in the Hebrew, the glory of God is departed from Israel. America is on the precipice of losing her covering, her protection. God has protected us. Uh, we, 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 since the, 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 the Civil War, there's not been blood shed on this nation. But we all are sober to the fact we're on the precipice of civil war and bloodshed in this nation because of what? Our leadership. There's there's no contention among Joe and Doug and Steve and I. It's our leadership that's doing this. And then, of course, she was discerning enough. She knew where to place the blame. She said because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law, and her husband. Now, here's a woman, uh, the, the weaker vessel, but she has such discernment. She says this slaughter, this, this, this massacre that's come to our nation is because of my husband and my father-in-law. Why? Because she understood the sin. And, and today, we don't want to talk about sin. You will never hear Joel Osteen stand up in the pulpit and preach against fornication, adultery, lying, drunkenness, and he, he, he won't say that. Why? Because that's not popular preaching. But if I go to a physician, don't cover my sickness and my disease. Tell me what I need to get cured and to become healed. That's why Jeremiah, uh, Steve just referenced that, he said, is, is there no physician? Is there no bomb in Gilead? Is there no way for us to be healed? The healing is solely going to come through Jesus and that healing takes place when we repent. Because when we repent, that initiates forgiveness and reconciliation. And the fact that as a nation and as spiritual leaders in the church world, nobody wants to address the sin issue. Uh, we witnessed a, a demon rise up in Obama the other day. He was so livid because he did not get what he wanted. That is the spirit of Antichrist. That's about control. That's about dictatorship. And people sit there and they look at that and say, well, there's nothing much to that. Yes, there is. There is spiritual contention here that far exceeds the natural contention that we witness by a man getting upset, getting mad. There is, there's war in the heavenlies. And, and unless we repent and, and, and become accountable, that, that's, see, God's word is called a standard. And the standard always stands until men say, we're not going to brace that standard no more. You know, we, it's just like Obama said, I will not defend the Marriage Act. That's treasonous. He should have been impeached right then. But what do they do? Nothing. And our sins are piling up and piling up and piling up. And regretfully, there's going to be a great slaughter among the people. And the only thing that can st stop it is, is the intercessory power of the saints and to move the heart of God to have mercy. And, and God knows he has shown us a mountain of grace and, and, and oceans of mercy, but it doesn't change the heart of the people. Go ahead, Steve, if you want to make a comment there. Wow. I mean, this is dog, and I just said wow, because what what you said there, Pastor, I mean, you, you said a lot. I especially like... Um, the comment about, and I don't want to take time from Steve, but I especially like the comment about what you saw in Barack Obama that day when the word came out that he was not going to get, or that the gun legislation was not going to pass. I've never, I, I mean, I've seen that look on people, but but I've never seen that look on Obama. Steve, I don't know, man. Um, I, I just well, got, the, I, got the willies when I saw that. Let me say this, the greatest gift necessary, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and David and I will talk about that as we pray in the third hour, but the situation is discerning of spirits. You know, you get this, judge not, lest ye be judged. Judging is sentencing, but they who are spiritual discern all matters, and we're seeing right now, Doug, the... the fulfillment of Isaiah chapter 3, 11 through 13. Again, someone said, why do you use the scripture? Because God's words are eternal. It addresses all men, all time. It is absolutely as relevant to the people of Jeremiah's day as it is even more relevant to the people of our day. Let me read this. 
Woe unto the wicked, it shall be ill with him, for the reward of his hand shall be given him. As for my, ch- as for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err, and destroy the way of thy past. The Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge a people. Doug, I went on record, and David, you remember this, when I was uh, talking to the gentleman who gave me the red list, the blue list, and the green list. I said almost, what was it, 15 years ago maybe, that he told me, and this is a man that it cost him his life to give the information on the red list, the blue list, and the green list. Some people had colors. That's not what was originally given to me. As a matter of fact, Doug, someone sent me the tape, and I'm going to have it uh, transcribed, and by the grace of God, I'll put it up on my website. And the interesting thing was, and I'm looking at the tape right now, uh, he basically said early on, that you'll know you're at the end. These were his words. When militant lesbians attain the highest law or highest official positions in law enforcement. Now, that's not bad for that many years ago. Okay, this is 2013, correct? And he right. said yeah. that in yeah, July, 1990, or July of 97, and his name was Gary. And the bottom line is, is that even Geraldo Rivera, I posted the story on my website today, talking about the, now he's a liberal commentator, but he's saying there's something wrong when you've got basically a, a group of women controlling the most uh, invasive and all-consuming power structure in law enforcement and land. So I'm going to read this again. As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead thee cause thee to err and destroy the way of thy paths. Now look, even Eli's children, Hophni and Phineas, are good examples of children that are out of control. And when we see the situation that comes into play, where there is very little fear of the Lord, and I want to make, a, make something clear. When I talk about the fear of the Lord, I'm talking about a supernatural impartation of reverence and awe to the majesty and the representation, the presentation of who God is by the Spirit of God, not the dumbing down, the numbing down, or the misrepresentation of heretics or uh, denialists. The bottom line is we have such a pathetic representation in the pulpit that most people, quite candidly, are ashamed, and that's why we're talking about manning up and standing up. Listen, it even says in the scripture that a eunuch could not enter into the congregation of the Lord. And what simply meant in those days, and I, I think it's, it's true in these days, is that the mighty men of valor in, in, that I referred to in the earlier passage of Babylon, they lost their strength. And the very first thing that usually happened to captive males is they were castrated. They became the La Castrata. And so the point is, is that we're, we're in a time mode where, you know, all I see is boxing matches and, and verbal slander and everything else going on within the body. But people have got to learn to judge according to what the Word of God says. Now, David quoted the scripture, friendship with the world is enmity with God. I will even make it what it really means is this. If you're friends with the world, you're at war with God. Is that correct, Pastor? Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, if so, you don't mind, uh, Steve, I, I, I'm sorry, Pastor, I, I'm sorry. If you don't mind, j- j- just, okay, that doesn't mean um, for us not to take care of our families. That doesn't mean to, no. uh, I mean, it, it, when you say friends with the world, g- can you give me an example or clarify that a little bit more? Because I, 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 it's kind of broad, vague to me a little bit, seriously. So, if you can give me like an example, I mean, go ahead, be- David. Uh, to be a friend of the world is 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 to go hand in hand, to be in agreement with 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 the administration that we're presently under. Oh, uh, to okay. sit with a uh, a pastor who says lesbianism and homosexuality is okay, I cannot embrace that. I cannot okay. be friend to that. The Bible says in Ephesians five eleven, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Now. I'm to wit. I'm, I'm. See, I'm to be a light, and and when I turn off my light, I become dark, just like they're dark. Gotcha. So I have, I have, to, I have to be a witness. That's what it means to be a witness. Now I want to address something. Steve talked about judging. People have misunderstood 
uh, Matthew 7 and 1 entirely. Judge not that you be not judged. Go to 1 John 4, 1. It says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirit, whether it be of God. For many false prophets are gone out into the world. Now, to try something, I've, I've been a jury foreman and set on jurors and different things. I don't have the power to sentence, but I have the power to rightly judge according to the plaintiff's attorney and the defendant's. I have the ability to sit there and listen to a matter. The Bible teaches that in 1 Corinthians. We don't go to court. We, 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 we take it to the church and we judge among ourselves who's telling the truth because we, the believers, will judge angels. So when Jesus is talking about judge not, it's it's talking about finding fault in somebody's life, and you've got fault in your own life, and you're elevating yourself and say, well, you know, uh, I'm better than that person. Just like the Pharisees said, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I possess. I thank you that I'm not like other men. And the publicans down at the other end of the altar, he's smiting his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Well, see, the Pharisee judged him. He said, I thank God I'm not like that man down there who's a tax collector beating his bosom and asking for repentance. See, he was that, that he was so he had so many telephone poles in his eye. He's trying to get the moat out of his toothpick out of his brother's eye. So when John said, "Try the spirit," it means to judge it. Now, judge it in what context? Is this of God or is it not of God? It's just that simple. Is it black? Is it white? Uh, Isaiah five and twenty says they will call bitter sweet, sweet bitter. Good, evil, evil, good. They'll put darkness for light and darkness or light for darkness. That's just how simple the judgment is. Now, I'm not have the power to say, well, you're going to hell and I'm going to heaven. God makes that choice. That, that's eternal judgment. But we have to try. He said, try the spirit. And, and, and that means uh, uh, taste it. See if it's good or if it's evil. Uh, that's probably a poor analogy. David said, oh, taste to see that the Lord is good. But my point is, we have to make a judgment call sometimes. As, as a parent, we have to adjudicate in our own homes. Does my child need this kind of discipline? Or does my child need that kind of discipline? We're trying to be pragmatic here. But we have abused that to the degree, well, you can't say anything. You can't judge anybody. You, 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 know, you, you can't say sodomy's wrong. You can't say adultery's wrong. You can't say drunkenness is wrong. You can't say anything anymore. Why? Because we've been transformed into being politically correct, and we're not concerned about being biblically and doctrinally sound. See, that's the difference. The Bible gives us the guidelines and how we are to live. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, nor abuse of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we too were one time sinners, but now we're in the light. And what does light do? It shows me where I'm wrong or shows me where I need to go. So you can't be holding hands with somebody you know is, 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 is a criminal saying, but, but come on, Doug, nobody's going to know. Oh, there's somebody that always knows. His name is called Jehovah. Well, let's, let's cover this up. See, that's, that's been a partaker and, and being worldly minded. That, 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 that's the mindset. Well, nobody knows. I'm going to steal this and nobody's going to know. Listen, that, that defiles the man, and the man is no longer pure. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Listen, if you have a good conscience, as soon as you tell a lie, your conscience says, that is wrong. When you pick up a piece of money that out of a cash register that's not yours, unless your conscience is seared, you don't have to be told you're wrong. You fly off the handle and you take God's name in vain, do you need to be told you're wrong? No. Because if you've got a conscience, your conscience is stricken and smitten and says, I have sinned, I am wrong, and I need to repent and get right with God. But see, we've come to the place. Our conscience has become seared, and that's what prophecy says in the last days. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the Spirit, speaking expressly, that in the latter times, 
some, not all, but some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared as with a hot iron. Now, I hear Obama say he's a Christian. I would look him eyeball to eyeball and say, Sir, there is no manifestation of God's Spirit in your life because you believe in same-sex marriage, you believe in abortion, which is murder. Don't tell me you serve the same God I do. That, that's, that's the problem. Well, you can't talk to him, like Dr. Carson. See, they, they, they loathe that man because he spoke like he did in front of the president. The president is just like me. He puts his pants on just like I do, and God is no respecter of persons. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess. But because of their position, this elitist mindset, this bigoted, self-righteous mindset looks at us as though we're some kind of trifling piece of trash. And God loves them, and God loves me like he loved this whole world. But I'm going to tell you, God is about full of his indignation, and it's going to run over soon. Because people, because God don't execute a judgment speedily, Solomon said, Men think they're getting by. If God struck us every time we sinned, we wouldn't have a chance, but he's a God of mercy. But there comes a time when God says, i got to deal with it. Just like Eli. He wouldn't. See, God gave men chances to get it right. The psalmist David, he murdered Uriah. He committed adultery with Bathsheba. We know nine months, at least nine months have passed. David has not repented. He's still a man of prayer. He's still fasting. The child is even born. So we know there's nine months passed. The child is born. The child dies. He breaks his fast. The servants come to David and say, why did you break your fast? He said, I, the child cannot come to me, but I can go to the child. Yet he still does not repent. And you all know the story. Nathan the prophet had to come tell a, uh, what's the word am I looking for here? Uh, an analogy uh, 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 about a rich man who came and stole a poor man's lamb when he had all the lambs and riches of the world. And David's indignation rose up in him. He said, the man will pay fourfold, and then we're going to kill him. And Nathan said, thou art the man. Now, David remained religious. I'm going to say for at least a year, because we know the child, the pregnancy was nine months. So God gave him time to repent. But I reckon because of his kingship and his authority, being such a warrior, a great man. But here's the key. He was still a man after God's heart. But God told him, because you did not make this right, the sword will never leave your house. And read about Absalom. Uh, uh, Tamar, uh, I'm trying to think of his name, slips my mind right now, uh, raped his own sister. Absalom slept with David's uh, concubines. He said, Judgment will come into your house because you will not, you did not repent on your own volition. And, and so, this is where we are. And, and that's why Paul said, I'm going to judge myself before God has to judge me. I'm, I'm going to look at my own heart. See, you see, uh, I think that's uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 4. Let me see if I can find that right quick. But with me, there's a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself, yet I am not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. In other words, he, he did an inner inspection and says, I, I know that my judgment can be skewed, but God's judgment is right. And if I'll let the Spirit of God look in, and I'll let the Spirit look into me and examine me, I'll realize I'm wrong. You, you know, you're not going to judge me to heaven or hell, Paul saying, but I'm going, I'm going to do an, an introspection on my own life. But see, we come to the point, we don't do that no more. We just sweep it under the rug, and we go on like nothing's ever happened. And that's why there's going to be a great slaughter, because we don't deal with it. I was always taught you deal with your problems. You don't ignore them. They don't go away. But you man up, you stand up, you buckle up, and you do what's right. And if you do, you know, if we would just do that, if we would go back to those principles. I've said this before, and I'll shut up here in a minute. 
if we just did one thing in this world, every man, every human being just wouldn't lie, what kind of a world would this be? Forget adultery, fornication, lesbianism, all that. just forget all of that. But if every person would just tell the truth and not lie, what kind of a world would we be now be living in? We couldn't fathom it. Just that quitting that one sin of lying, but we don't. We're lied to every day. We're misled. The truth is misconstrued. It's, it's unbelievable where we're going, and that's why there's going to be a great slaughter. And like the salt, that just, that, since yesterday, that hit me so powerfully. We are the salt, and we're going to be thrown out in the streets and trod over foot by men because we've lost our saltiness. Wow. Did that answer your question, Doug? Again, you yeah, know. Very, very, very much. Yeah, yeah, and that that's it. Of course, no one, and especially me, and I know Joe, did, but both of us united, and and all the listeners, we don't agree with with the uh, with the ways of the world. It was the um, how it was phrased that that I had the question. So I'm no, I'm, and I'm glad too that that uh, I understand that I understand this. Okay, let me give you a good example, and this is, this is, I think, something that everyone's got to really search their heart. Everybody's got an opinion, I've got mine, and obviously there are many people who make it clear to me in emails every day and uh, manuscripts every week where I'm wrong, but here's the thing. I know enough to know to tell people to go to Jesus. They're looking for people to go to them, and the problem with putting a man on a pedestal is that that man was never meant to be on a pedestal because that's Jesus' throne. And I think it's important for people to understand if they let a seed of evil or a seed of misconception be planted in their heart and they don't check it against the word of God and they simply follow the other sheep or lemmings that are going off the cliff, they can't blame God. I think God puts so many roadblocks in front of us. The greatest roadblock he's put in front of us to keep us from going our own way, which would lead us to eternal damnation and separation from him, is the word of God. The second is our conscience. The third is the testimony of creation. The fourth is the fruit of the spirit versus the fruit of the flesh, the works of the flesh. Let me tell you a good example. And I'm only saying this because, again, a guy named Rick Warren wrote a book, The Purpose Driven Church, okay? And I said at the time that book came out that I said, of course, that's a, a work of the flesh because it's driving the people who used to walk in the old ways right off a cliff of basically uh, uh, subjective theology based on feel-goodism. In 2000, Rick, uh, 2006, Rick Warren said this, Christian fundamentalism will be an enemy of the 21st century, okay? Then you, flat, you fast forward to 2013, and we get the military being taught that uh, and being briefed in their army briefings that religious extremism is uh, basically, you can sum it up, in evangelical Christians and Catholics are among the biggest threats to America. And then he said, of course, along with Islamic supremacist groups uh, like al-Qaeda and Hamas. So let me get this right. People that are blowing up people, blowing themselves up, absolutely raping children, the point is somehow now we're all lumped together. Now I want everyone to understand this. In Albert Pike's World War III vision, and you can go, and there are people that argue, did it really, was it really a letter for, uh, between Pike and Giuseppe Mazzini? Look it up, ladies and gentlemen, Albert Pike's uh, Third World War. You'll see it, the quote. Here's the deal. It's going by the book. The, the point was Muslims and Christians and Jews would all be basically marginalized, and then they, the Luciferians, the illuminated ones, would basically inherit the earth, and the pure doctrine of Lucifer would come on the scene. You know, I, I got raked over the coals tonight by a cop and, and, and basically telling me I don't know anything about police work, and my answer to that would be a three-letter word, duh. But what we're trying to do is warn everybody. He went on to justify himself as being a constitutionalist and, and, and a, a, you know, a, a full uh, scored you know, uh, uh, defender of law enforcement. The thing that I'm trying to say, and I'm using that as an example, people always want to justify the area and the uh, uh, attitudes and mores or morals around them by how they feel, how they think, and how they act. Since David, you know, basically spelled out David, King David's uh, 
issues, and David didn't see it until the time where that space to repent finally ended in a sentence from heaven. I have been absolutely saying to people, and they get mad at me. They tell me to leave the country. They tell me this, that, and the other thing. And I tell them that it was men of God that stood up and resisted evil that gave us the freedom. Now, obviously, in the context of the end times, in the context of the times we're now living in, that we are in a position unlike any other in history. Yet the Scripture teaches that everything that's happened in the Old Testament, everything was an example or an ensample unto us, how we should live. God says, look at this nation. It did that which was right in my eyes. Look at how it was blessed. I mean, Doug, if I could tell you in the last week, I've probably gotten seven or eight emails, people unknown to each other, and I haven't published them yet because I'm waiting to see the collective theme, but the Statue of Liberty drowning in the ocean. I, e, A. A. Allen saw that in, what, 1957. Everything from the Statue of Liberty's torch being out, chopped up in pieces, uh, uh, floating, surrounded by ships of foreign registry. The point is, is that all the kings of the earth come together at the uh, Battle of Armageddon or Armageddon, basically to make war against God. And see, this is what people still in the Christian world do not understand. From Genesis 3.15 on, there is enmity between the seed of Almighty God and the seed of the serpent. And, and, and I'm going to give a, a scripture here that is really critical tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, for those of you that still will name the name of Jesus, for those of you who still love the Lord Jesus, for those of you who are yet to come to Jesus, for those of you who want to come back to Jesus, listen to this cool thing that comes out of God's word in Malachi. Then they that feared the Lord, this is Malachi three sixteen, seventeen, and 18, then they that feared the Lord spoke often one to another, and the Lord hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrance was written before him for them that feared the Lord, and put in their honored and revered the Lord, and that thought upon his name. And now listen to this. Then they and they shall be mine, saith the Lord of hosts, in the day when I make up my jewels, and I will spare them as a man spareth his own son that serveth him. Then shall ye return and discern between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. That has nothing to do about judgment, i.e. sentencing. It has everything to do with discerning. One of the things that most Christians still fail to do because of their preconceived uh, end time charts on the wall by basically dispensational thinking is they still cannot get it through their mind that there is a period, a testing and a trial period that's coming upon the earth. God even basically tells the people in the book of Revelation, if you don't repent, I'll thrust you into the great tribulation. How is it that when we come on a show like this, and thank you both Joe and Doug for letting us have this sign, and we're saying, oh men of God, stand up, rise up. I had a guy send me an email, I forget his name, and he said, for the first time in my life, I got to lead somebody to Jesus. And I'll paraphrase. He said, I've been afraid of what people will think. And he said, but when I finally led that person to Jesus, I'm paraphrasing, he said, it didn't matter what anyone else would think. What I saw was someone who would have gone to hell, coming into the kingdom of God, being forgiven, and coming into God's family. Now, let me say this. The scripture is very clear on this. They that win as souls are wise. We are contending tonight for countless tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. And, Doug, it is no exaggeration, is it, to say that this show has been heard, just the last show we did last week was heard millions and millions of times. It even superseded what either Blog Talk or the other you know, group could even believe. It, 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 it superseded the amount of people that listened to Oprah, did it not? That's correct, yes. yes. So what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen, there is a hunger around the world, and I literally, and I don't know, I can't, I'm, you know, I'm counting uh, kind of uh, in the top of my head. This is to give glory to Jesus. It doesn't matter what people think of the messenger. And, and David, am I correct in saying this? That messengers of God don't really have a good acceptance among the people, yet I have purposed in my heart as, as, as basically, I'm not going to go the way of King Saul. Well, the people made me do it. One minute the people are blessing you, the next minute, literally within 24 hours, are damning me. One minute they think I'm just the greatest thing, and I, I don't think that at all, okay? And then, then they go out of their way to make sure that everybody knows that I'm a scoundrel, blah, blah, blah. Now, why is that critical? Because that's the absolute frailty of human ego and vanity. 
God sent Jesus to basically die on the cross, to basically give his life for our life, and so we didn't have to wallow in the filth called planet earth and sin, and that he would take us, give us new garments, that our minds would be renewed by the washing of the word of God, that our spirits would be transformed by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and people have become so carnal, and, and I wrote the book on carnality. I could, do, I could say this, 101 ways to be carnal and infuriate everyone around you, okay? But now I'm saying, Lord, just because I came out of the muck, just because I've eaten seven different portions of dog vomit, and First Peter says, you know, when you go back to your sin, you're like a dog returning to its vomit. People probably who have had pets see that. The pet throws up and they eat their vomit, okay? That's the analogy of what happens when we have the living water, when we have the bread that comes down from heaven, when we have a, a, a table prepared for us in the wilderness, in the midst of our enemies. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, when the money fails, when the money fails, that's when God's power, his presence, his purpose, his direction, his guidance, and his supernatural peace will be given to his people like no other. Somebody sent me an email, Doug, I don't know if you saw it, and, and it, was, it was such a cool word, and I thought, that's the practical word of God. David, I don't know if I told you this, but the word of the Lord was, that, and this person was praying, Lord, how will I know? When it's time to go, wherever you're going to leave me. And the Lord said, when the toilet paper's gone, you'll be gone. And I thought, how true is that, okay? In other words, that's a convenience we all take for granted. It's better than grass, better than dirt, pine cones, or a sponge, okay? But there's coming a time when that which is familiar and keeps us in the realm of indifference and kind of keeps us numbed and dumbed is coming to an end. Doug, I was on your show, what, was it two weeks ago, three weeks ago, when I said from this point forward, and I don't remember, you know, forgive me, but I said judgment's coming upon the land. God's giving the mega churches and pastors time to repent. If they don't repent, they're going down. Now, someone says, well, that's so judgmental. No, that's the word of God. And the thing that we're trying to speak to people tonight, especially the men of God, I know the women's heart. I have so many amazing, and I'm saying amazing, they blow my mind, women of God who are discerning, who are warriors, who basically will go up to the giants in front of them and just basically say, who do you think you are? Meanwhile, the men want to basically say, I'm so glad my wife goes to those prayer meetings. And this is what I'm saying tonight. If you can stand up and shout at a ball game, and I believe this, I, I came up with a word, and David, I think you remember this word, narcosynthesis, and how I define that word is, is that by keeping everyone in a state of perpetual entertainment and the endor endorphins or whatever that are associated with all the neurochemical process in the brain, people don't have to think, they don't have to make judgment, and of all, they don't have to act. I'd say the greatest travesty in history is when God absolutely begins to move and his people say, well, what's all this commotion about, Pastor? Well, that's because judgment is coming, and, and that's why he gave us the solemn warning and that judgment must first begin at the house of God. So it's, it's not, we're just telling people the judgment is coming because we have our ear on the railroad track. And I hear, the, I hear the train coming. I hear the bustling sound. Uh, there's a scripture that jumped out at me last week as I was reading my Bible. Proverbs 17, 23. And, and, and Doug, answer this. A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. A wicked man taketh a gift out of the bosom to pervert the ways of judgment. Where would you say that happens five days a week in this nation? Uh, Congress and the Senate. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, yeah, I, I was going to say every office building in, in, in the United States, but uh, that, no, see? you're right. Now that's, that's what that, that, that defines friendship with the world. A wicked man takes a check out of his coat and puts it in the politician or the pastor's hand or like Ted Turner asked could you get adultery out of the Ten Commandments? And what does that money do? It perverts the way of judgment. And so because judgment becomes skewed, God says, I will show you judgment. I will show you when the scales are false. 
the balances are not right. I will show you what I mean. And when God begins to wield his sword, I mean, we're in trouble. Because, you see, God, he is the personification of justice. You know, he, 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 he can't stand it when you don't take care of the orphans and the widows. And there's a protocol, First Timothy chapter 5, a widow. She has to have been at least 60 years of age. She had to lodge strangers. She had to wash saints' feet. You see, God gives us so much outline in the Scriptures for everything that we do, but because we're so illiterate to the Scriptures, then we don't know what to do. And, and so that's why Steve kept reiterating so much tonight. You you got to get back to the word, people. We're not going to be judged by a by law, by a constitution, by a bill of rights. God will judge us solely by His word. And if I know the word of God, then it helps me to live right. I tell all businessmen, read the book of Proverbs. It will make you wise as a serpent and harmless as a dove. There's nothing wrong with being a shrewd businessman. But when you become shrewd through lying, cheating, embezzling, you're not shrewd anymore. You're a crook. You're a crook. So judgment will come because we don't judge rightly. And, 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 and that's the problem. And, and, and God knows um, it breaks my heart to, to know. I told a businessman the other day, and I said, I'm, I'm going to say something very candid and something very open here that that's, uh, doesn't look well on me as a minister. But I, I said, I used to loathe William Jefferson Clinton. I, I thought that guy was as low as they come. Most people listening tonight would love to back up 20 years to where we were in our, our nation and our leadership to where we are now. Now we're redefining marriage. At least he, he understood, you know, what was right about a man and a woman. But look where we have digressed since Bill Clinton was president. Look, 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 look at the attitude. Look at the change. Look at the openness. It's unbelievable. And I thought, I thought Bill Clinton was about as low as a man could get. You know, governor committing adultery with rapidity. And, 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 and I'm thinking, but look look at what we, there were still things in the closet. The, the homosexuals had not come out. Uh, uh, there were still things that were, were better. I'll, 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 what I'm trying to say is, look how much we have deteriorated in 20 years. Think about where we were in 1993 and then where we are today. It, it's hard to, and just think about this now. If we change that much again, in the next 20 years, if the Lord God of Abraham should tarry, what in the world will it look like? This president says, I don't want my daughter straddled with a baby, an unwanted child. What kind of talk, what kind of leadership is that? Teach abstinence, sir. Don't teach abortion, teach abstinence. Because that sin of fornication will take your children to hell. But that's not the remedy. Their remedy is, Go get an abortion. Murder. And we wonder why we're in the condition. You see, it's become so subtle, but I, I saw Satan rise up in that man last week or this week after those the Senate didn't vote what, the way he wanted. I, I saw a, an air about him that I had not seen since he was president. And there's an element of vindictiveness, and I will get even. And you, you mark my words. I, I really believe very soon there will be another so-called Sandy Hook. They're, they're going to force this. And you all know the contention. There are police officers on YouTube challenging their brotherhood. Will you take your uncle's guns? Will you take your wife's guns? There are lieutenant colonels telling them there's about to be a coup in this nation. Why is all this happening? Because we are not honest people and forthright anymore. Criminality and crookedness is the way of the day. That's just who we are. And that's why the Bible says a wicked man takes a gift out of the bosom to
to pervert the ways of judgment. Perversion is the key word for this 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 nation. And and we were talking early. Uh, 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 Steve quoted from Isaiah three twelve: Children would oppress and women would rule. I'm not a male chauvinist pig, but let me ask one question: How many women were there at the framers of the Constitution? That's a good point. Good point. How many yeah. were there? Yeah, and- Zero, to my knowledge. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, yeah. You see, yeah, now and, you see, now there'll be people say, "Well, you're narrow-minded." Listen, my wife's body is totally different than mine. My body's designed to work and make a living. Her body design is to have children and to nurture them and train them in the home while I'm out making a living. There is a, 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 a profuse difference in our our physicality, oh, and paging Rachel Maddow teaches that the wife is the weaker vessel. And we are to love them and to nurture them and pray for them so that our prayers are not hindered. See? And so when I say how many women were there to frame her, because most true women that I know, most godly women that I know, do not want to be up in the front. They want to be behind their husband. I am my wife's covering. I am my wife's protection. Good godly women don't want to be up there in your face. Now, that's not to say God can't use women. That's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about the nature. How after Adam and Eve sinned, he told Eve, your desire will be to your husband. There's something there uh, that God put there after the fall. I I shared this one time, and this makes people mad. But, but, But women, for the most part, want a man's affirmation. How does this dress look on me? How does my pocketbook look? How do my shoes look? How does my hair look? Why do they say that? I'll tell you why. God gave me insight on that one time. Because the devil promised Eve something better if she would listen to him. Not only did she not get what he promised her, she lost what she had. Now you think about that. He said, if you do this, you will get thus and thus and thus, and you'll be like God. So she made God a liar and the devil telling the truth, and she believed the devil. So she lost everything that she had, and she did not get what he promised her. So women are, for the most part, looking for their husband's affirmation. But the Geico commercial, Abraham Lincoln, his wife says, does this dress make me look big? And he you know, makes the little index finger and thumb to... And she gets upset with him. But see, she was looking for affirmation, even in that commercial. But see, that's because the devil deceived her and lied to her. And so now a wife, a woman wants that affirmation. And they should get that. But they should get it from their husband and not some other man. You see, that's why the whole steak and rotten thing's messed up. Everything about our society's messed up. But... The women were not there framing the Constitution because women were 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 were, were feminine. They 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 understood a man's place was to go out there and and, and do these things and then come home and share the news of what, the way things are going. And I know I'll get criticism for that, but I'll be misunderstood and misinterpreted because a man is to love his wife as Christ loves the church. What's happening? Our whole society. Is, is, well, just to show you how, how far off we are, when two lesbians get together, one of them has to play the male role. Isn't that funny? Isn't that, isn't that weird that one of them is, is the butch? Yeah, yeah weird, yeah. not funny. Uh, and there you know was a, on Comedy Central, or I, I think I saw uh, one of the TV hosts on Comedy Central re- refer to a new series that was coming out about creation and, and uh, like Adam and Adam, so something along those lines. But yeah, it made yeah, no a sense perversion, because perversion, a perversion of creation, it, it, yeah. it, 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 sexuality. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, gentlemen, we have to take a break. Uh, you're listening to the Hagman and Hagman Report. We do have uh, Rachel Maddow and all of the uh, uh, hosts on uh, from CNN and MSNBC on lines waiting to talk to Pastor Langford. I'm just kidding. Uh, seriously, he, uh, a lot of sense, folks. Is this making sense to everyone? I think it yes, certainly it is. is to me. Uh, we talk about the, the world. 
conform, uh, conforming with the world. The churches are conforming with the world instead of standing up for what is right. And oh, standing absolutely. up for what is right even when it is wrong in the eyes of the world. And that is the problem. Folks, Grant, what was just great first hour. And I'll tell you, um, it's about time that men and women, but men especially, men of God, uh, stand up and back up what's right stand up and back up God's word and not be afraid. You know, you know what, uh, uh, Pastor, i got to say this. Um, it, to me, it's easy, and it's the coward's way out in a way, to talk in generalities about your faith and about Christianity. But the moment you invoke the name of Jesus or start talking specifics about your faith, it seems like you lose or people tend to turn away and become embarrassed. Or I sense an embarrassment there. I don't know if that's perceived on my part, but I've, um, or, or even, you know, I mean, I've been guilty of that in the past. It's okay. It's manly to talk about your faith, in a way. A lot of us has been, have been there. Yeah, yeah, you know, but but uh, don't don't get too specific. No talk about don't invoke the name of Jesus, because that means that you're getting, you know, too 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 specific and and even I think Steve alluded to this but rather judgmental. And, and, you know, you can't have that. But anyway, welcome back, gentlemen. Uh, Steve, where do you want to take this? Well, I want to take the name of Jesus because I think that in, if you guys are, are paying attention to the scriptures that we're using, I did not talk to David, nor did he talk to me about the scriptures that we're both using and we're both praying over. And this is critical that you understand that because the point is, is that this is a tapestry of redemption. When the Bible speaks literally of the robe of righteousness, we're giving you the threads that the blood of Jesus literally stained those threads to put on you a royal robe. And I want to say something, Doug, and I'll make this clear. The Lord asked me a question. I think I mentioned it the first time on your show, and please forgive me, I don't remember men. But the Lord literally asked me, he says, Steve, if the people won't confess me before men, what makes them believe I'll confess them before my Father which is in heaven? And oh, I said that, and somebody sent me a robe. Well, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. King David said, the same guy that committed adultery, uh, the same guy that committed murder, the same guy that numbered the people of God, in other words, but he still had a heart for God. Here is the biggest failure amongst those that want to slander and slam the brethren. Jesus said it would be better for those of you who make a living on your blogs to do that and go into the chat rooms to do that, it would have been better for you never to have been born. Now, those are the words of Jesus. You get mad, get mad at Jesus, than to cause the little ones to stumble. We tonight are declaring the name of Jesus. And I, for one, I quote Romans you know, uh, 1, starting verse 16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm going to deny, by the grace of God, I'm going to be ashamed of the King of glory who absolutely created everything, breathed into Adam the breath of life, literally forming him as the grandest sculptor in history. And I'm going to say to my Redeemer, um, or I'm going to be disparaging, and by the way, I will never refer to the Lord God of Heaven. Now, certain Jewish people get mad at me for saying the Lord God of Heaven. When God tells me it's okay to call him that, uh, I call him that. When Jesus appeared to me, he did not appear to me as he would to a Hebrew who has just accepted Jesus and, and is saying he's Yeshua HaMashiach. The name of Jesus is the most forbidden name on earth, yet at the name of Jesus, the scripture says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. It is so amazing to me that you can be as profane, you can be as derogatory, you can be so horrifically, uh, 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 what's the word, horrifically contemptuous of the living God. You do that to the Muslims and to, to their faith and they'll put a fatwa out on you. The Christians have have hidden long enough. And I believe that to, tonight the clarion call is to you men of God. What Pastor David Langford is telling you, what I'm telling you, is the same thing. There is coming such a horrific judgment upon the United States of America. You've seen it. I used to get mocked up when people say, Ah, oh, America's a Christian nation. You should leave it because you don't love your country. And I used to say, And you don't love your God. Because there's a difference between God and country. 
You know, what does the scripture say? Woe unto the nations that forget God. And I think the, the key here is most people don't understand that obviously everybody quotes the scripture on Sodom, you know, and they just assume that it's uh, only sodomy. But let me say this, Ezekiel 16, 48 through 54, now this is the same country, Doug, that would have done, we've, we've set the standard when we walked in God's ways for the rest of the world. We didn't just bring, quote, we didn't just shove our beliefs down people throat. If it weren't for the Christians, there'd be no hospitals, there'd be no, there'd be no kindness. And women, if it weren't for Jesus, would be nothing but basically, uh, from the age of six on, just perpetually raped property. Now listen to this. As I live, saith the Lord God, hmm, if Ezekiel can call on the Lord God, why can't I? Sodom thy sister hath not done, she nor her daughters, as thou hast done, you and your daughters. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister Sodom. Pride, oh boy, we know that goeth before destruction. Fullness of bread, I have all I need, that's the attitude. Can't uh, Get all you can, can all you get, and put a lid on the can so no one else can get anything. And abundance of idleness was in her and in her daughters. What are the biggest reality shows on TV? Now listen, they're the... The sisters that are whored out by their mothers, and I won't, you know, obviously can name them. They're the, the housewives of this town, the housewives of that town, this, that, and the other thing. And you know what? Most of them make the women the strong money spenders, while the husbands who bust their tails to buy them all the baubles and jewels stay in the background, and they're almost made to be the buffoons. Now look at that. Listen, nobody would have thought that Ezekiel 1649 would apply to this. Behold, this was the iniquity of thy sister taught him. Pride, fullness of bread, abundance of idleness was in her and her daughters. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and needy. Then God goes on to say, and they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw good. If it were not for the Christians, even right now, praying and interceding, so many of the Luciferians will lose not only their eternal souls in hell, but they're going to lose that which is even precious to them. And I don't care who it is that believes whatever they do believe. The point is everybody holds something precious and something dear. Even their relationship with the Prince of Darkness, they cherish. But when it's all cut off, when it all ends, when the toilet paper uh, goes, so do we. When the money fails, so do we go into the wilderness. I don't think people realize it. It was only after the money failed in Egypt, only after they had sold everything they could sell just to eat, that God led the children of Israel out of Egypt into the promised land, or the land of promises. So what I'm saying, Doug, is this. We're going to talk about Jesus in the second hour. There is nothing to be ashamed of. Are you kidding me? You know, I, I would encourage everyone to read and, and forget about the pictures you see in the Christian bookstore. Go and read in the first chapter of Revelation what the King of Glory looks like. By the way, God is called the Lord of Hosts. And if the uh, armies of this world think they're going to come up against the armies of heaven, they're going to, and they're going to prevail. They've got another thing uh, loosed. I mean, they, forgive me, they need uh, uh, some sanity loosed in them because what David quoted in the seducing spirit, you see, the sin of Sodom goes way beyond. Now, we used to have missions, and there are still some missions, but people wouldn't believe. They didn't believe when I said the homeless are being systematically taken, executed, and disposed of. I had four-star generals, active duty special operations command, talking to me about that in the years 2006, 2007, 2008. And the smoky trucks. Oh, that was hilarious on some of the boards. But then people started saying to me, you know, we noticed that. Where are all the homeless going? And when the veterans started being assassinated, and I mean assassinated, when they started to disappear, when the veterans started getting uh, hang-ups on their phone calls, I kept telling them all, I'm saying, listen, you guys, they're going after you, they're going after you. And, and, and I, I said that. I mean, it's a matter of record. And, and the thing that is, is so troubling to me, Doug, is that now the people that go to the little houses with the little steeple and listen mostly to drivel. There are exceptions to that. If you're a man of God who preaches the Word of God, there's no office I hold in higher respect. David will tell you that. There is no disrespect to me for those who preach and teach and live the gospel. For those who are nothing but hirelings and whores, I got news for you. Don't shake your head at the prostitute 
on the street corner. Don't shake your head at the houses of ill repute. I'm not uh, condoning that. I'm just saying you need to start shaking your head. And I said this years ago, Dave, remember this? And I think you got the scripture in the same context before we talked to each other. God said that the name of America will become a hissing in our enemies' nostrils. Do you remember that? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'll, I'll, I'll yield now to you, because the thing is, I've made the point that we're going to talk about Jesus. You can quote the scripture, he is the way, the truth, and the life, but if you don't know him, you're not in the right way, you don't know what truth is, and you are living in perpetual death. Go ahead, my pastor. Well, everyone listening, for the most part, is familiar with Deuteronomy 28. It's the chapter of blessings and the chapter of cursings. There are 68 verses in that chapter. 14 speak of blessing. You want to know what the other 54 speak of? Curses. Why is there so much emphasis on cursing? Because God wants you to understand the ramifications of sin and of judgment. Now, there are just 14 short verses talking about blessing because of obedience. Because that's all God ever wanted to do was bless us. How would you like uh, for your children, everything that you ever gave them, you you would buy them a new shirt, a new pair of slacks. They go in there and get a bottle of Clorox and pour all over it and ruin it and cut it up, throw it in the floor and say, hey, I want something better than that. And you go out and you do something better than that. And you and you get the same treatment. You get the same treatment. That's what we're doing to God the Father because he gave the very best that he had. He gave Jesus. And he loved the world so much, he gave his only begotten son. He had no one to choose from but Jesus. He didn't have three or four children. He only had one because he came from his heart. And he gave him to mankind. And what did men do to him? They martyred. They spat on him. They brutalized him. They mocked him. They spit on him. They beat him. Men did this to Jesus. And what does Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And you talk about compassion. You talk about love. But that's where people misconstrue Christ. The first time he came as a lamb and as a child wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. But when he comes the second time, He comes riding a great white stallion with a rod of iron. He said he will rule with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress, the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, Revelation 19. And so you have this picture and a prophecy given of a Savior that will come and will die for us, that we can be redeemed. And, 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 and the psalmist declared in Psalms 107, too, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. There was nobody uh, drank any more whiskey than me before I got saved. I'd buy half a gallon on Friday night. It's all gone Sunday morning. I, I partied as hard as anybody in this world. I regret that. I, 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 I have great... Uh, Sorrow for that. I, I, I hate the things I did. But let me tell you, when Jesus saved me and redeemed me, I did a 180. And, 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 and I gambled, I lied, I cheated, I did all the vile things you can name. And I'm a minister now, so I won't name all of those things. But all he done to me, he didn't brainwash me. I'm still the same person as far as my personality my traits, my gifts, my faculties, my abilities. But what he did was he redeemed me. And he turned me 180 degrees. And I'm just as crazy and foolish for the Lord as I was the devil. And and I hope even more so for my Lord. But God don't brainwash a man when he saves him. I was never a coward. Somebody would say, did you fight? I would start a fight just to get into a fight. I went to the gym three, four days a week. I, I cra- just a crazy man, just, just an insane human being. But God had called me to preach when I was 12, and I was running from that. I didn't want to be a preacher because I knew what was going to happen. I'd lose my life. Whatever I aspired to be or wanted to be, I never could be that. And I ran from God. I ran. I, nobody ran any more hard than I did. 
You know, I'd get up in the morning, go to work, and I'd start smoking pot and go to lunch and drink whiskey, trying to mess up. <laughs> Sure. I'm sorry, David. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I know what liquid lunches are. That's why I'm, I'm laughing. I, I was trying to smother that conviction. I, I couldn't stand it. And the night I gave my heart to God, I was sitting at a Holiday Inn in a lounge uh, with a woman fixing to go to the beach for a week, and the Holy Ghost spoke to my heart said, if you don't repent tonight, I'll never deal with you again. Well, I'm not a fool. I knew the voice of God. I knew the Spirit of God because I had been there. And I said, I'm leaving. She said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to get saved. She said, what? I said, you have no idea. I, I left her there and drove straight to my grandparents at midnight. They didn't even lock their doors back then. I opened the back door. She was in the kitchen, and she had gotten up to get a roll aid, she told me later on. And she turned. She said, what are you doing here this time of night? And before I could answer, she said, you came to pray, didn't you? And I sure did, buddy, because I was running from God. And my point in telling you that is this. These people who are cowardice and their spirit for Christ, you, if you've really been washed in his blood, remember Peter? He's cursing. He's swearing. I don't know this man. I don't know this man. But after he is converted, Luke twenty two thirty one, Jesus said, Simon Peter, Satan hath desired to have you, that he might sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not, and when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Everyone listening tonight, Satan has desired. That word desired in the Greek means he has exceedingly demanded that I give your soul to him, Peter. Satan has demanded your soul from me. But no, and he's desired to sift you as sweet. That word sift in the Greek means to pierce, to perforate, and to riddle. That's how... That's how that's how much hatred Satan has toward us, and we don't even know that. But see, God saw the future. Jesus knew what Peter would be, bold as a lion. After he's cursing and swearing and saying, I don't know the man, he repents. He gets baptized in the Holy Ghost, and he stands on the day of Pentecost and says in Acts 2.36, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly, that same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and Christ. Listen, folks, that guy had so much testosterone, he said, don't crucify me like my Lord. Hang me upside down. Now, you, you talk about a man that was on fire for God. Hang me upside. I'm not worthy to be crucified like my Lord. But you see the difference? He's cursing. He's swearing. I don't know this man called Jesus. But when he got plunged beneath the blood, spiritually speaking, and full of the Spirit of God, he was a crazy man. He didn't care. Why? Because when you lose your life for Christ, it don't matter. When Henry, uh, Steve, you may be familiar with the story, Henry was in some city praying, and a guy come out beneath some stairs and put a knife to his throat, went up behind him and pulled his head back and put a knife to his throat and said, I'm going to kill you. Give me everything that you have. And Henry said, you can't kill me. I'm dead in Jesus. The guy dropped his knife and took off running. That's all. Everybody knows, how, knows Henry how meek and lowly he is. But that holiness and boldness spirit came on him and said, you can't kill me. I'm already dead in Jesus. So my point is, we either we're on or we're off. It's just that simple. And you people say, well, it's just not that easy. Yes, it is. Now, there are times the Holy Ghost will prompt me to witness to somebody, and there are times I'm looking for God to say, speak to that person, tell them about me, and he doesn't. And I wonder why, and I finally figured it out. It's not going to do any good if I do. There are those who have ears that are ready to hear, and he will prompt me. I've been in parking lots. I've been in car lots grocery stores, and it's been one day it's on to witness, the next day it's off. And I, I used to say, why? And then the Lord showed me, they're not going to hear anyway, and you're not going to cast your pearl before swine. I, I had a member whose son uh, overdosed, and they called me into the home. This is the most cruelest thing that's ever happened to me in my life. I, matter of fact, I had just come off that 40-day fast. I was still a very broken, humble man at the time this took place. And I was at the family's home. And the, one of the sisters came in there and sat down on the couch with me, and she said, 
why did God do this? And I said, ma'am, I said, God didn't do this. This is the work of the enemy, Satan. He comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Her other brother walks up while I'm sitting on the couch. He has a 45 pistol holster on. He looks at me, and he said, if there is a God in heaven, I can't say what all he said. You tell him to perform this oral sex job on me. At the, I mean, a litany of curse words. I almost fell on the floor. My spirit was so grieved. I've never heard anybody talk like that when I was a sinner and then declare if there is a God to, to perform a sex act on him. This is a man talking about God Almighty. And I turned and I looked at the mother and I stood up. I said, ma'am, with all respect, I cannot be a part of this, and I will not be able to do this funeral. And I walked out the door, and I said, God, if he shoots me, he'll shoot me in the back when I walk out. But I am not going to be in this house and be taught I'm a man of God. But that showed me how bold and how aggressive people will get angry with you as a believer. And you just have to take it. They will persecute you. They, they will, they will, Jesus said they will kill you in John 16 and 1. He said they will kill you and, and, and they will think they've done my service. After Lazarus was raised from the dead, the Pharisees said we've got to kill him lest the people see him alive and believe the works of Jesus Christ. They were going to kill Lazarus. He already was dead and hadn't done anything to nobody but got raised from the dead and John chapter 12 tells us the, the, the chief priest and the elders sought to kill him to destroy his testimony that Jesus had raised him from the dead. Now, you, and these are religious people. These are the people leading the nation of Israel that think they're right with God. So you, you, you cannot be ashamed of Jesus. And there are times you, the Lord will just tell you to be quiet. Don't cast your pearl before swine. And there are times... You will be uh, 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 ordained to, to witness. You'll be ordained to speak something. Because that person is at a crossroads and God will use you then. But that's when you, you need to know how to discern the situation. You need to have enough of the spirit of Jesus living in you. Because the Bible said in Matthew thirteen fifty eight, he did not many mighty works there because of their unbelief. If Jesus couldn't do some things, what makes me think I can? So that's what it means to be led by his spirit to know when to and when not to. There's been a many a time in a restaurant when my children were little, we'd get to the table, we'd sit down, and we would pray. And people would come up and say, I saw what you did, sir, with your family, and give all my children a piece of money, a dollar a piece or whatever. That happened numerous times. I'm not ashamed to pray and bow my head. You know, I've had people walk up weeping, say, I, I saw you pray, and it touched my heart. I wouldn't pray to, 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 for, to be seen of men. It's just I love my Lord. And I mean, I wasn't over there hollering. I just bowed my head and took my family by the hand and said, let's pray and thank God for what he's put before us. You know, So you never know. You don't have to fly flags, but just do the right thing. That's what righteousness is, is doing the right thing. And if it's in public, I don't eat nothing, even to this day. If my wife makes me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, I bow my head and thank God for it. I thank God for everything. The Bible said that everything give thanks. And when you love him, you know, you'll thank him even when times are difficult because God's trying to mature you or bring you through something and nurture you. And, and it's not easy. I'd, I'd be derelict if I said all this was easy. But you have to be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might, and when you really love him, it's not hard. It's not hard for me to feed my family. It's not hard for me to put clothes on my children. Why? I love them. It's when you don't love Jesus that it's hard. I, I'm not tempted to go out here and get drunk, go out here and party. That, see, I, I'm way beyond that now. It's other things the devil will challenge you in your honesty, your integrity, your forthrightness. Uh, keeping your word, whatever the situation might be, because he knows how to set a trap or snare to get us. But I've always said, if you'll just pray and read your Bible, 
And, and we, that's what we call devotion. Have devotion. We are devoted to Christ, so we have devotions. You'll have personal devotions. That will keep you and, and, and make you sensitive when something comes up. Something comes up. You'll have strength to say, I'm not going there. Like Joseph turned, walk away. He ran out of his garden. But he would not sin with Potiphar's wife, and he would not sin against his God. So, you know, as my grandpa used to tell me, uh, being a Christian, when you serve God with a pure heart, it's as natural as a duck going barefooted. And I never seen a duck with a parachute. <laughs> that's the truth. Yeah. No, it is the truth. It, 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 you know, Doug, I, I want to re- comment on ducks going barefooted. What What is obvious is that God saves us on his terms and by his grace, but men just repudiate that and they come up with a bunch of rules. Now, I'm not talking anything on God's part. I'm talking about men's religion. And all the religions of the world, you got to do something to get right with the whatever deity. And in some cases, you got a million or two of them if you're, if you're in the Hindu world. The point is, is that you have the most remarkable presentation of love in Jesus. You have the most powerful presentation of forgiveness. You have the Son of God being challenged by the spirit of religion in such anger amongst the religious. They will kill him. Pastor Langford quoted the scripture. There'll come a time and they'll kill you and believe they're doing God a favor. I can tell you uh, from personal experience, there's a lot of people that would like to do God a favor by doing me in. And the bottom line is, is that they actually cloak their anger and their hatred. Even the name of Jesus. I get everything. Don't you know that there's no J in the word Jehovah? Absolutely. I know the word circumlocution. I know the whole development of it. And I don't call God Jehovah. I don't have an issue with that. I call him the Lord God of heaven. Uh, people say, you need to call him by his sacred name, Yahweh. And I said, you don't even know what his sacred name is. That's not what it is. Well, why isn't that what it is? Because there are no uh, vowels in Hebrew. So the point is, is that people will do anything to justify themselves. I got news for you. Pastor Langford said it, and that's why I laughed when he, whiskey for, for lunch, you know, I mean, good night. I think I lived on a liquid diet, and I know what that means to basically be drunk, stay drunk, and uh, be funny all the time until you about drown in your own vomit and you're hauled off the hospital with alcohol poisoning. The point is, is this, is that we're talking tonight about every reason. Listen, men will brag about their sexual prowess. Men will brag about their drinking ability. Men will talk, brag about how tough they are. Whether they shoot pool, uh, uh, those of us who drive fast cars and have driven fast cars until we got married and our wives make us slow down only when they're with us, the point is, is that the, 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 we'll brag about everything. i got news for you. There's nothing to brag about. What did, what did the Apostle Paul say? He said, I'll glory in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's where my bragging rights lie. And it's not in anything I've done. It's not a works I can do. Of course, it's grace. But, you know, Pastor Langford gets the same kind of emails, the same kind of diatribes. People are so offended by things other than abortion, sodomy, murder, lying, stealing, bribery, all the things that would be distasteful to anything normal. Look, it's not, it's not enough now that little girls are sexualized by the age of, what, 10 or 11 because of all the hormones and everything. The, the girls are being turned into well-developed girls, so a 12-year-old no longer looks like a 12-year-old. They've got little dolls that are dressed like hookers. So basically, you know, the girls, little girls can get in touch, their words, not mine, with the sluts within them. We have seen the image and likeness of God torn up. We've seen it trampled underfoot. And I'm here to tell you, if you men of God who love Jesus will stand up, and if you women of of God will take your hands off the twisting of their lower parts and let them be, if you are in that, uh, that process, hands off. God has given them their manhood for a purpose. And I'm not kidding you, David, when I say this. You and I both know that there has been a tremendous amount of Jezebel like emasculation of the American believing man. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Absolutely. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what we're talking about, let me, let me give you a good verse, because tonight we're going to pray for the Holy Ghost 
to come upon each and every listener and every place in the world. It, it, this is remarkable. A man sent me an email and actually called me on the phone, I think from the Philippines, and tells me that, that there are places where they get together and listen to this broadcast, Doug and Joe. Listen to this. They download it on thumb drives. I said this before. I, I've heard South Africa right now. There's South Africans listening, and they get together and they have prayer meetings. They're crying out to God, speak to us tonight through that program. I'll tell you what, I, and I'm just humbled because obviously one of my favorite heroes is Balaam's donkey. Because at least Balaam's donkey was smart enough to see the angel and uh, put the you know the brakes on. Unfortunately, so many men are. But I want to give everyone a promise that's as real today. I understand the Baptists will litigate it. I understand people will try and define it. But here's what it says. In the book of Acts, Jesus told the disciples to tarry in Jerusalem, and, and they went to the upper room. They're waiting for the promise that Jesus has made them, to send them the comforter. For these are not drunken, as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. I learned what that meant in the Holy Ghost versus, uh, you know, uh, uh, Jim, Jim Beamer, whoever was the, uh, uh, vibration or the vibe of the day. But this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And it shall come past in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. When God says all, he doesn't mean some. He says all flesh. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I'll pour out in those days my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs, which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain whom God has raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that Jesus should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand, and I should not be moved. If you will lift up Jesus, if you will call upon the Spirit of God to pour out his Spirit upon you, you will be able to stand firm. You will be able to stand fast, and God will lose us, loose us, not only from the pains of death, but the fear of death. We can quote, and they overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb, and, and the, they love not their life unto death, and the, by, what is it, Revelation, David, quote the scripture for me, they, they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, the word of their testimony, and they love not their lives unto death. Right. So once you settle it, once we settle that, you know, the thing is, is that that's what sets us free. That's what causes us to be the men of men, and, and men that God wants us to be. And I can tell you this, my heroes are all within the pages of Genesis to Revelation. My heroes in even the real world are men and women of God. And the smartest people I know isn't Stephen Hawking, it wasn't Carl Sagan. They're the men and women of God to seek the scriptures, that search the scriptures to see what is and what isn't. There are some amazing gifts. God gives the good gifts to church. But you've got to understand the God of heaven wants you to have the gift of the Holy Ghost. You know, uh, people say, well, what is your passion? What motivates you? I'll give you a simple word. Jesus. Well, what purpose do you find in that eternity? What good are you? Well, I'm no good, but his good gets transferred through me to others. And see, I don't go and say, well, Lord, you know, you really should do it this way or that way. I have given him some suggestions in dealing with the Congress of the United States, but so far he has not taken them. And I'm saying that to be funny. The point is, is that we're talking tonight, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. And if you and I become members of the body of Christ, then you cannot quote that scripture without taking your active place. And I've said this, David, a hundred times. I said, if anybody ever tells me that they're behind me, I turn around immediately and I grab and I grab them alongside. You've heard me say this for 20 years. No, I, wanna, I want you to walk where I walk. I don't want you pushing me off the cliff because you freeze up. And I don't want to go off the cliff because, quote, the minute you're patting me on the back, that pat, the, the hand that pats you on the back will usually be the one that stabs you in the back. And that's why, again, Pastor, we talked about betrayal close to 20 years ago, did we not? That's right. And the betrayal is daily now. 
we have been betrayed by some of the most powerful and most visible men and women on TV. It doesn't matter. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. You've got to add an S to everything, okay? I mean, you can't just believe that the Comfort Sisters uh, will basically get you into glory. For those of you who don't know what Comfort Sisters are, in certain cultures, a Comfort Sister is a prostitute who sleeps with the man of God so that the man of God's physical needs can be met so that he can minister the spiritual needs. Listen, I don't care. Somebody says, well, you can't talk like that. I can. Pastor Langford's a pastor. I can say things he can't say. because, And I'm not saying he would even think the things I say, but people have got to basically get it. You know, David, seriously, if, if, if people would start becoming offended by the things that offend God, they'd find out that their fighting, their nitpicking, and their bickering, and their murmuring would cease if they would take up the real fight. But you know what? It's amazing to me how people can hang behind anonymous emails, anonymous letters, no postage, criticize and everything. And, and I even ask people all the time, I say, look, it doesn't matter. Ask the person who's griping, complaining, belittling, trashing, slandering me, Pastor Langford, whoever, Rick Wiles, uh, whoever, ask, ask them how many people they've won to Jesus. Seriously, ask them how many hungry mouths they've fed, how many people without clothes, how many people have they done anything to? Because James says, and I'll, I'll paraphrase it, well, it's fine you say, have, you, you say you have faith, but show me your works and I'll believe you have faith. Uh, faith is something that's real. It's not imagined. And I've got to tell you something. Jesus is not the tooth fairy, and when the people of God find out who he really is, they're going to be surprised. And my goal in life, Doug, Joe, and, and David, is to put the awe, the absolute reverential awe, back in people's revelation of who Jesus is. If God would grant me that, Request and I prayed it all my adult Christian life, 42 years, even when I didn't know anything, I felt if this Redeemer will redeem me, and I can't tell the stories because they're just too profane, but I can allude to some of them. The thing is, and there's hope for everybody out there. Some of you are running from God. You are mad at God. You feel like you've, you've, you've stepped over the line. Uh-uh. Ladies and gentlemen, it's, it's, this is not uh, let's make a deal or whatever, or whatever it was behind door number one, Door number two or door, door, door number three, the, the, the call of the living God to the prodigals is come home. I love you. doesn't matter if you're a man, woman, child, or somebody getting ready to go into eternity. My prayer is that no one would go into eternity tonight listening to David Langford or me or Doug or Joe, any place in the country and, or in, any place in the world. And Doug and Joe, you guys are prince amongst men to let us come on because this is a burden on the Lord's heart. This is absolutely before all hell breaks loose. And, and forgive me, I won't say that again. As all hell breaks loose, as all hell breaks loose, and people are absolutely baffled by the lies and the absolute aberrations of the truth and the absolute uh, personification of evil, the, the schemes of evil men, the wicked plundering of everything that most Americans thought would be their heritage and their golden years. This is the Jesus that will take us through it. And uh, it's true we're going to go through a lot of stuff, but Jesus walks with us through the stuff. And he'll never leave us, he'll never forsake us, and he said, Lo, I am with you, even unto the end of the age. If I did not encourage myself in the Lord, I would have given up a long time ago. And I can tell you something about giving up. You can throw in the towel until you run out of towels, and guess what? There's a whole laundry bag full of towels again, so it, you don't get any place, you get every place by believing God is who he says he is, will do what he says he will do. And for those of you who have prayed for Pastor Langford, who have prayed for Doug and Joe and myself, may you receive a reward a thousandfold in this life. For those of you that are taking this seriously, for those of you who are turning your hearts to the living God, to those of you who are saying enough of this bickering amongst ourselves, I'm going for Jesus. I can tell you this, you, can't, you don't go for the gold, you go for the God of heaven that created the gold and, and owns the, the cattle on a thousand hills. So the power of the Holy Ghost is what we're talking about. What changes ordinary men into extraordinary men? What changes just nominal women into phenomenal wisdom, women? What changes uh, uh, basic uh, uh, juvenile prayers into prayer warriors? What changes interceders to intercessors? 
It's the power of the Holy Ghost. David. Well, uh, uh, if, if I can just, uh, this is Doug. Yeah, go right ahead, Doug. Yeah. I, I just want to say this. Uh, uh, based on the emails I've been getting, and I've talked to uh, uh, in, uh, people within the intelligence industry, uh, both Joe and I have this week about the events of this week. I mean, we started off with uh, markets going south, and then, of course, the Boston bombing and uh, the West Texas explosion. Uh, now, tonight, uh, for those who haven't heard, there's uh, been a shooting in Denver, Colorado, at a pot celebration, uh, injuring two people and basically scattering a crowd of thousands who had gathered for their first counterculture holiday since the state legalized marijuana. You, you know, as we look at these things and put these things in context and talking with the people we've talked with and looking at the news and analyzing things, it seems like we can't get straight answers out of out of our government, out of our media. Uh, and Joe and I, and, and I, and I dare say most every person listening to this broadcast, we're simple people. I mean, when I say simple people, we don't live in the realm of high finance, high banking, uh, Congress, uh, you know, the elite. We're not among those people. And we want to understand. We want to be on the right side of history. And more importantly, we want to be on the right side of God. We want to know that when we lay our head down tonight, that if our soul is taken, that we are, you know, we do end up in the right place for eternity. That's all we want. And and, and I think that's why people now are, are coming. Because if I dare say this, people under, are understanding that something is terribly wrong in this country. And not only this country, but worldwide. And we're seeing it manifest by these events that I just referenced. And we're seeing it uh, overtake us. And, you know, I think that... Uh, uh, if nothing else tonight, you folks, gentlemen, um, have really are really uh, helping the normal folk among us, if you will, the people who are uncomplicated and looking at this without uh, the unnecessary complications of the doctrinal differences other people argue about. We just want to be. A, we just we just want to be. Uh, and, and, and we want to full, fulfill our duties. I mean, I, I don't know. That was on my heart. I just wanted to say that again. Uh, maybe that was out of context, but I feel it's important given all the things that are going on. And we need to be prepared because time is short, I feel. Well, it's not out of context. This is why we are to be the salt. This is why we are to be the light. Because the world that does not know God because they're not being presented with a true revelation of God, and they're getting concerned. Uh, there's a scripture in Zechariah 8.23, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass, that ten men shall take hold out of all languages of the nation, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Now, somebody will say, well, you just use that scripture, and it says, because you are a Jew. Well, you've got to understand the context in the New Testament with that, because in Romans chapter 2, Paul says we are Jews inwardly through the Spirit, not outwardly, but circumcision of the heart. For he is not a Jew which is one outward, neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the Spirit, and not in the letter or the law, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And so this is why it's imperative that we are not ashamed of Jesus in any context. Now, in Acts chapter 2, excuse me, Acts chapter 1, Jesus gave the great proclamation, Acts 1, 8, but you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth or world. Now, when he gave that prophecy, they may have thought this is going to be an easy task because we're going to be endued with this great power. Uh, Luke 24, 49, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. So they're looking for this dudamous power. 
But what got them to go to Judea and Samaria? Persecution, tribulation, adversity. Acts chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And Saul was consenting unto his death, talking about Stephen. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Now the apostles, they stayed in Jerusalem, but those that were converted, the disciples, they went out into Jerusalem, Judea, and to the uttermost parts of the earth to share the testimony and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul was such a great an apostle, because he established so many churches in Asia, because that was God's commission for him to go to the Gentiles. And so that's why it's imperative that we as Christians, we need to be ready for persecution. I know everybody gets afraid of that word, 2 Timothy 3, 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. The key word there is God. Uh, when you live a godly life, you'll be persecuted because you will say adultery is wrong, sodomy is wrong, lying, cheating, etc. Now, if you're a flim-flam, you'll be persecuted because you don't stand for anything. Well, you're not suffering for righteous sake. You're suffering because you're a con artist. Uh, even Todd Koontz, he's the new money changer on television. He's here locally, and uh, our local ABC affiliate did a story on him. And uh, they, Lamborghinis, uh, Ferraris, uh, you name it, he has them in his million-dollar apartment. But he's, he's a money hustler and it doesn't preach anything about scriptures or living right. It's just, you know, God wants to bless you. Send your money to me. And uh, uh, they said his apartment he bought was well over a million dollars. Well, the love of money is the root of all evil. And Paul said in 1 Timothy 6 and 5, these men are destitute of the truth. Now, you think about that statement, destitute of the truth. Well, what we're doing here tonight folks, is telling you the truth, and that's Jesus. And these men that, that are out here that are hirelings and charlatans and pretenders, they're destitute of Jesus. They are destitute of the truth. And we're not in it for any, just like Doug, we're, 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 we don't run with the upper echelon. You know, I have a little farm down here. I have six or eight chickens. I think I have eight cows now. Uh, we, we, just, we just work and, 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 and preach Jesus. And we don't, we don't run with the world, and when we don't uh, contend with them, we just minister. And uh, we catch flack, we get criticism, we get hate mail, we get it all. Uh, but, you know, I'm like Paul in Acts 20, 22. He said, Behold, I go bound in the Spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bond and afflictions abide me, but none of these things move me. You can curse me, you can criticize me, and whatever. That ain't going to bother me, and it doesn't. I don't say that to be arrogant. I, I, some of those letters I've gotten, you wouldn't believe, I couldn't read them on, on the air because they're so filthy, but they're from Christians, so-called. Well, I've never used that kind of language since I became a Christian. Yeah, I used to, when I hit my uh, hand with a hammer, I'd curse. Now I just, oh, man, that hurt. Because I've become so progressed in the Lord, I, I, that don't even come out of my mouth no more. I, I've lived so long for the Lord now, I don't even think like that, see? Because my nature has changed because of God's presence in my life. And so now I think about the good things. My heart is broken. My spirit is grieved. I look at the world as it is now, and I think my children have to grow up in this world and, and I, I understand now, before my dad passed away, he told me, he said, I, I don't know if you should even have any more children. Uh, the world's becoming so vile. Well, it's just human nature for a, a man and a wife to desire to have children, to have offspring. God made it that way, to replenish the earth and multiply. That's what, what he told Noah to do. That's the, that's the natural mindset. But I understood what my dad was saying in the context of vile is wicked, you know. I'm sitting at the dinner table one day, and the Holy Ghost speaks to my heart. My, my oldest daughter was 12 years old, and the Lord says, 
What are you going to do when she gets pregnant? And I said, to her, I said, I don't want to hear one word you got to say about that. End of end of conversation. Six years later, she gets pregnant out of wedlock. I'm a human being. I go through the same stuff that anybody else goes through. But the difference is, just like this morning, I get in here and I get on my knees and I put some good gospel music on and, uh, and turn the music down and I pray and I talk to God and I read my Bible because I made up my mind, I'm going to make it. I didn't get in this thing to lose. I was a loser in the world. I got in this thing to win. I got in this thing to have good success, like he told Joshua. And if you will not let my words depart out of your mouth, then shalt thou have good success. And I think about the joy that I have in my life. And when I go into eternity, I'll have eternal joy. Sure, this life has its ups and downs. I mean, I've preached scores of funerals. I've seen brokenness. I've seen suicide. I've seen all sorts of stuff. And that's, that's, that's because of sin. Everything that we witness, the brokenness, the tragedies, the heartache, the, 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 the Boston Marathon, uh, just what Doug shared a minute ago in Denver, these things are because of sin. Now you can smoke your pot and get high and it's okay. You see, everything we're doing is leading us down a greater path of destruction and chaos. See? I mean, how many... How many times have I been sitting at a card table? I was sitting at a card table one night. I'm ashamed of these stories, but I'm just telling you, life is real. And one of the guys wants to change the, the game because he's losing so much money. And I'm sitting there with six men. All of a sudden, everybody pulls a gun, but guess who? I don't have one. And they got guns cocked at each other's heads. Say that again, I'll <laughs> blow your brains out. I know what the world is like. I was out there. It, do I miss that? Absolutely not. I, I wouldn't even dare go back to those places. I wouldn't even want to be there again. It's by the grace of God that I didn't get killed during that time. And and, and God didn't let it happen because he had his hand on my life. And he was very merciful to me. And, and some people he will give, you know, eight, ten chances. But I know what he said to me that night. You either get right now or I'll never deal with you again. And I feel in my heart there's some people listening to me tonight. You know, you're at a crossroads, and I know it's time for a break. If you want to take your break, Doug, we'll come back and address this. Can do, Pastor. No Thank you. Go ahead, Joe. No, I just wanted to say I'm really enjoying uh, just listening, even in uh, Ford. And uh, it, it's a very powerful show. And, yes, Pastor, you're right. Things are changing. People are on the fence. They are being given a choice, uh, maybe a final choice, of which way they're going to go. And we see this divide continuing to grow. And uh, I hope people understand what choice is right and which one they need to make. Truth, contrary to what our government, our media, and even some of our neighbors want you to believe we can't handle the truth. We are back with our two very special guests, Mr. Steve Quayle, stevequayle.com, and Pastor David Langford, the voice of evangelism.com. These gentlemen are not uh, plastic. They're, they're, they're real men. They're real men of God. They're, I'm very proud to call both my brothers. In fact, I'm humbled by that. I, I don't even know if, if, if I can live up to that. Uh, that uh, term actually but anyway folks you're listening to the hagman the hagman report final hour right now high gear kicking into the lightning round with both of our guests bookmark their sites visit stevequail.com daily and certainly find ministry in the voice of evangelism.com uh steve i'm gonna turn it over to you let's rock and roll well i think that what we're gonna share now and just as the holy ghost leads us most people don't understand the amazing, amazing opportunity we have to not only take God as word, but to literally change the course of history. And I want to, I want to give people, I, I'm in the King James, Isaiah 11, 1 through 5, talking about Jesus. And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots, and the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. The spirit of wisdom, the spirit of understanding, the spirit of counsel, the spirit of might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. 
and the, shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. Ladies and gentlemen, you're in a war. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Christianity is not passivity. Christianity is not uh, your kingdom but his kingdom. Christianity is not, quote, just a principled lifestyle. It is the absolute redemption, the empowering, the enabling, the transformation. You know, Pastor Langford and I were talking, Doug, and here's where, here's where most of the easy believism goes wrong. When the Holy Ghost gave David his uh, last chance, when the Holy Ghost gave me my first chance, not that I didn't have many times last chance, I mean, uh, you know, just the stories of how many times I was literally almost killed is almost baffling even to me, yet God had a purpose for me. And I want to make something clear. We're talking about the spirit of the fear of the Lord. I didn't know enough outside of listening to Derek Prince uh, tapes and, and going to his uh, uh, sermons and different conferences around the country, but one thing I always wanted, I wanted more than anything, I wanted the fear of the Lord because I knew, and I really did know, I had full understanding and awareness of how totally trashed I was as a human being. I had absolutely no second thoughts, no, and I actually, uh, I, I should say this, as a party guy, I not only knew how to revel in it, I knew how to drag everybody into it to the point that, you know, I mean, uh, you know what they always say, the guy with the money buying everybody their beers and bringing the ladies is always the most popular guy at any party. But when I got saved, that same passion and zeal, the, the thing I wanted more than anything, I wanted the fear of the Lord because I had heard Derek Prince, and ladies and gentlemen, for those of you around the world that can go on the Internet, go on the Internet, go to YouTube, and type in Derek Prince, D-E-R-E-K-P-R-I-N-C-E, because he had a wonderful teaching on the fear of the Lord. And it's the fear of the Lord, the desire for the fear of the Lord, and as Pastor Langford said, some of you tonight are getting the clarion call that he got. The Spirit of God has, has, uh, has been striving for you and with you all these years. Don't say no to Jesus. Can I tell you something? It's easier to say yes to Jesus and let him help you change your life than you try to change your life, make yourself good enough for Jesus. No one can do it. The, I, I used to have people come up to me, David, you'll appreciate this, and Doug and Joe, and say, when I give my testimony in the church, you know, I'd go give my testimony. I guess I was the closest thing to a rascal being saved by the love of God. And, man, people throw money in the plates. Well, in the Assembly of God world, you know, I mean, you could be, I wouldn't be St. Stephen. I'd be St. Plate Stephen. And those of you who are pastors, Know when you've got good speakers, people really, once God touches their lives. I saw miracles. I don't know any gospel that's free of miracles. I don't. I don't know how to relate to people that don't believe God is the same today as he was yesterday and will be forever. I don't know how to relate to people that deny the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I don't know how to relate to people that, that don't believe that, that the book of Revelation is yet to be fulfilled, that they think everything's already been fulfilled, even though the very scriptures are jumping off the page at them. You see, this isn't about winning an argument. This is about going into war. This is about winning people. This is about keeping people like me from going to hell. Well, I remember the Lord said, Doug and Joe and, and Pastor Langford, he said this to me. He said, I'm sending you in the highways and byways. And then uh, Pastor Bruce gave me a word, but Steve, his angels are going with you. And uh, Henry Gruber has walked the highways and byways. I haven't done what he's done. But the bottom line is it's, it's out there where the people are. You could no more get me into uh, uh, an organized group of people sitting in pews in, in an organized uh, religious function. I just can't go there anymore. Yet give me the people that are hungry for Jesus, whether it's any place that the Lord says speak. And I'll give everyone the best word of wisdom I know. Pastor Langford referred to it earlier. You ask the Lord, Lord, bring someone across my path today that's open to hearing about Jesus. Because so many times in Scripture, Doug, we hear, having eyes to see, they see not, having ears to hear not. That covers all of America when it comes to the truth. If I hear one more person say, well, I don't believe that. It wasn't on Fox. They're already lost. Fox, MSNBC, uh, uh, ABC, CBS, 
Guess who owns them, people? Guess who owns them? The thing is, is that there is no truth in them. The Holy Ghost spoke specifically through Jesus. The whole world lies in the evil one. And the evil one is out to distort all truth because there's nothing that absolutely makes the enemy of all men's souls more upset than the truth. Because he knows once the word of God abides in you and you abide in the word of God, then you know the truth that says to set you free. For the world to use that is just like a, basically a streetwalker uh, giving uh, advice on uh, how to dress appropriately for a Sunday picnic. The two don't go together. Or putting Dracula in charge of the next Red Cross blood draw and talking about all the people that are going to be helped and smiling, you know, with uh, his fangs dripping. The point is, is that there has to be a reality check. And what David is saying tonight is this. For many of you, please, please simply say, God, I've been running from you. If you have, God, I don't believe you're real. But if you are real, reveal yourself to me. And, and David, before we went on the air, I couldn't tell you how I just felt that, that and it shall come to pass that all, and, and I felt the Lord says, Steve, make sure everybody understands all includes them. And it shall come to pass that all who call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered and shall be saved. So this is what we're talking about, Doug. You know, I don't know if there's any other, and I, I believe there's probably other ministers that pray for people on the air and all that stuff. That's good. But people need to recognize. I want to say something about uh, women. Thank God you women have been an intercessors filling in the gap for men. Thank God that Queen Esther was Queen Esther, and she was admonished. She had the king's scepter held out to her. And, and if it were not for the women of God praying for their husbands, the husbands who would be sports fans into eternal, in eternity, probably a lot of them wouldn't make it. Now they're waking up. So, ladies, my hat is off to you, my hat and my heart. It was women who were around the cross. When, and when Jesus was crucified, it was women who were at the tomb. So please, all I'm saying, understand this, that it is imperative. It's women who have prayed me through. It's Pastor Langford's prayers and Pastor John Kyle who brought me the word of the Lord and brought Pastor Bruce York and, and men of God and, and my brother Daryl who encouraged me at the darkest hours of my life. But it's been, it's, what I'm telling you is, look, we're in this thing together, and the time to fight is not each other. It's now time to stand up, rise up, and engage the enemy, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. And, Doug, that's what it's all about. When you and Joe let us come on like this on Saturday night, and you spend your three hours, I want you to know, brother, you are given a cup of water in the name of the Lord, and God is going to literally literally see that your needs are met. And ladies and gentlemen, Doug paid a horrific price, I mean a financial price, to come on and do what he's doing. He never asked me to do this. A lady, God bless you, Joy, a lady sent me one of her heirloom watches, and I started to weep, and it's a 14-karat gold case watch, and she said, give it to Doug Hagman. Tonight she sent me, I don't know if it was tonight or yesterday, and I apologize, Joy, my nights and days are all the same, and and she said, it doesn't matter, Steve, just get it to him. When I see sacrifices like that, she was apologizing because she thought it was worth more. And, Doug, I'll, I'll talk to you off air, but I'm going to, you know, do, I'm going to honor her wishes and send you the proceeds. But I said, Joy, it was your heart. And I love her name. By the way, Joy, and any woman who's named Joy out there, God bless you. What a great name. Righteousness, peace, and joy. But I said to her in an email, you gave from your heart. You don't apologize. You never apologize. When you give from your heart, it's never wrong. And that's what we're talking about tonight. Jesus not only gave from his heart, his heart literally was broken. His heart, his side was pierced. His heart broke. First ran the blood and then ran the water. They've done magnificent anatomical studies on what Jesus went through. And ladies and gentlemen, you can't come to the refreshing waters of the living waters until you first get washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so tonight, that's what Pastor Langford and I are here to talk about. We're here to talk about the one who set us free. And we're doing what King David said, let the man whom the Lord has redeemed say so. And by the grace of God, I just want to take this time to thank each and every one of you intercessors, each and every one of you praying women of God. And I just sent uh, Pastor Langford, God knows, I've heard, uh, by the way, I've heard Kim Langford pray. And I trust, and I'm not flattering her, 
But I can tell you this, when uh, my son and I were down with Rick and David and Kim, uh, Tyler said to me, man, did you sense the Holy Ghost in that hotel room? And I said, and I said Tyler, there is a woman of God. And so I know the prayers of a woman of God. And I can tell you what, when, when a husband and a wife, and I, I know David and I know Kim, and I don't know a lot of other husband and wife teams. I'm, I know Bruce and Susan are the same way, and, and some of you other out there. But i got to tell you something. It, it is exciting to me to see that unity, that agreement in the Spirit, and God wants that power in the household to break the yoke that's over a lot of our households. And by the grace of God, and through the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimonies, and loving not our lives unto death, we will overcome the evil one. Pastor. Amen. Doug, do you have anything you want to share before I I want to I want to get us prepared to, to reach out to people uh, in a few minutes? Uh, well, Pastor, the only thing is is that uh, I just see us coming toward uh, headlong into a situation where, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, we look Americans look at this week as being a very trying week, and it was. But this is nothing compared to what's coming. If if what I was told this uh, here over the course of the last couple of days is even half true, we, we better buckle our seatbelts because we're going to be tried like no other time in history in this country, and it's going to be hitting us from all sides. Uh, so having said that, I know that you can yeah. impart your wisdom. Joe, do you have anything you want to share? I don't want to deprive anybody of anything that's on their hearts tonight. Honestly, Pastor Langford, I am enjoying this like a listener uh tonight i am uh just happy to be here with listening to you guys so you take it away well i just want to uh, people to be prepared or, or get their hearts because i really sense in my heart that god is dealing with some people tonight because you know i've been knowing steve for for 20 years and We've shared a lot of our past experiences. I, I can't say that about Doug and Joe, and I hope they've not been as debased as Steve and I were. But uh, we know what God can bring you out of. You may look at your circumstance, and you say, there's no way that God can change my life to the degree he's changed you and Steve. But he can. I, I, if I would tell you some of the things of my life, you, you wouldn't believe it. You'd say, there's no way. But as I said when God saved me, he just turned me 180 degrees. I'm the same person, the same faculties, gifts, talents, whatever you want to call them. He just uses them now for his glory. And the, here's the key. We don't know the last time that the Holy Spirit is going to deal with us. Genesis 6 and 3 says, My spirit will not always strive or contend with man. God's not going to fight you to redeem you. He's done paid the price. It's a gift. It is absolutely free. As Steve quoted the scripture, Romans ten thirteen, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You will be saved. And that's what all of this is about. It's not about money. It's not about making a name. And I know Doug well enough to talk to him enough. This is not about numbers and money and prestige. This is about obeying the Lord, and doing what God has called us to do. Joshua said to his family and to Israel in Joshua twenty four fifteen, Choose you this day whom you shall serve. But as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And that's the way it ought to be in the home. The man needs to take the leadership and the role. And I've always said this, if a man is a godly man, his wife, I believe, will follow him. It's when he teeters and totters and he's half in, half out. Man, men, be a man and stand up and say, like Joshua, we're going to serve the Lord. And that doesn't mean your wife doesn't have a, a say-so or a personality or, or any input, but God made the man head of the household. And men, you need to lead and lead by the word of God. Lead by example. Don't use that, well, do as I say, bless God.